Welcome back, everybody. We're going to do the first half of this documentary over Olaf Palme. Um, I did the video prior to this sort of about his political career and why he is or was such a polarizing figure. I wanted to do that before I jumped into this just to sort of get some background on it. And when I did that, it was actually pointed out to me that I knew who he was, at least from like a general should have recognized the name sort of way, because of him overseeing the Sweden's nuclear policy and and their basically their their build up in nukes and then their decision to not they didn't actually create nuclear weapons, but they had everything there for it. Um, at least I, I think that's, if I remember correctly, that's what it was. And then they basically changed directions and got under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. And there was like an agreement reached and all that sort of stuff. But I had heard his name before due to all of that. Um, I just didn't put two and two together with it. But I'm really excited about this from the comments of the other video. I can see he's still a bit of a polarizing character. So really anxious. Let's go ahead and jump into it. The Forbidden Trail. Fairwegen Street in Stockholm. Two gunshots have been fired. They've killed the Prime Minister, Olof Palme. I am convinced there was no conspiracy. This crime was committed by a single person. Over the last 15 years, investigators have come to the same conclusion. But have there been mistakes in their inquiries? I'm coming at this thing basically totally blind on everything that goes into it so i feel like it gives me a little bit of a different viewpoint with that being said that statement doesn't totally make sense to me that i'm convinced there's not a conspiracy that the gunman was just one person that that like two plus two doesn't equal four there you don't you don't have to not have a lone gunman for there to be a conspiracy. I don't know. That just seemed that seemed like an odd. That doesn't necessarily mean that that couldn't have happened. som gett mig som det gav mig två ögon Kan jag klart urskilja Det svarta från ett vita Och högt där uppe Himlens mantel ströd med stjärnor Bland mängder människor Och den är så jag älskar This is the last photograph of Olof Palm, the Swedish Prime Minister, taken just hours before his death. On the 28th of February, 1986, John Walbage carried out the photo session in the Premier's office. We shook hands and bade our farewells. And he said, I see your name is on the list of people who will accompany me to Moscow. I replied, yes, exactly. And he said, so we'll meet again in Moscow, if not before. And then we parted. And how did you find him? He was in good form. He was laughing and joking. On that Friday, there was a happy, relaxed atmosphere at Rosenbad, the seat of government in Sweden. Olof Palm was about to take a weekend off, something of a rarity. At 5.30, he returned to his home at Gamla Stan in the old quarter of Stockholm. As usual, he had no bodyguard. 
Palm wouldn't give up. Okay, so is that since his assassination, do all Swedish prime ministers now have 24 hour like surveillance bodyguards there all the time? I'm, I'm assuming that would be something that was put into place pretty soon after this. His close contact with the people and had always refused personal protection. He wanted to live normally. Palm was ever willing to chat and to share his ideas on social democracy. A man of the people, he'd been able to implement some of his ideas. Palm was highly charismatic and had the ability to galvanize those around him. It was impossible to be indifferent to him. While most people appreciated his forthrightness, it also brought him many enemies. Whether at the Kremlin or the White House, Palm never held back from taking a strong personal line. He vigorously condemned, for example, the American stance on Vietnam, even going as far as to denounce the bombing of towns and villages as one of the worst crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. Palm. Yeah, you're not going to get much argument from me. I'm not a big fan of the Vietnam War. Was also an ardent defender of the Third World. He maintained excellent personal contact with Ortega, Castro, and Arafat. His stance on world affairs gained him many friends, but also an array of vehement enemies. His assassination therefore gave rise to much speculation. Suspicion was leveled at the CIA, then the KGB. Fingers were pointed at the Kurds, as well as an assortment of right-wing extremist groups, the Iranian secret police, and protagonists of apartheid in South Africa. However, the favorite theory of investigators was that this was the work of a lone assassin without any political links. But there is one more line of inquiry which merits special consideration. Night has fallen. Mr. and Mrs. Palm decide to go to the cinema. They are going by metro as always and without a bodyguard. At 8.30 they leave their house, but at the same moment Ala Strombach is returning home from work. As I reached the spot, I heard a noise, as though someone had climbed over the grill there. A man passed by here, and I watched him. He passed behind me and stopped in front of this door. I said to myself, why is he stopping there? Twenty meters away, Mr. and Mrs. Pound were on the point of buying their metro tickets. There was another noise, and the man took something from his pocket. I made out that it was a walkie-talkie. Then he started speaking to someone. Other men equipped with walkie-talkies were also spotted between here and the Pound's house. Sorry, let me turn the brightness up some. I feel like it's it's too dim. Um, so that doesn't necessarily sound like a lone assassin. But um, also, the, the very idea and nature of lone assassins are a little bizarre to me. Um, there just aren't... There just aren't very many, ex like... The historical examples of this, even if you look at something like World War I, where, yes, you have one singular gunman who basically starts the war, you know, in, in Gavrilo Princip, um, there was a, an entire group behind it. There were even, there was even at least some in the, in the Serbian government who were involved with it. It's not clear really to what what level, but um, so even in a case like that where you have a a lone person who actually does it, the the examples of of it just actually being one person start to finish, I feel like there's not that many of them. Um, I don't know. So just that line of thinking in general seems a bit odd to me even if you even if you are of the viewpoint that it's legitimate that particular 
I don't know, reasoning seems like an odd one, in my opinion. If you're going to do something, like this isn't, you're not doing a B and E. Like you're not, this isn't carjacking. This is a, a political leader that you have to assume, if not being guarded, is at least being watched. And so it just seems odd. But I don't know. I, my first thought for, for anything like this would certainly not be it's one, one dude start to finish and that's it. In addition, just before the palms arrived at the entrance to Gamla Stan Station, someone saw a man busy using a walkie-talkie, which he was trying to conceal in his jacket. Okay, so another eyewitness, more walkie-talkies. By the way, I've heard him say Palma, Palm, and I said Palme, starting it. How do you pronounce this guy's name? The man behind the ticket desk noticed yet another character who seemed to be following the palms. And the metro driver saw two men follow the prime minister and his wife onto the train. So by the time the train left the station, nine unusual occurrences had been noted by various witnesses. The cinema was situated on a street called Sviavagang between the second and third metro stops. In the area immediately surrounding the second metro stop, witnesses would later claim to have spotted yet more men equipped with walkie-talkies. But Mr. and Mrs. Palm had decided to get off at the third stop, Rodsmangatan Station, and walk back away to the cinema. Okay, so question. At this time period, was it common to have a undercover government or police presence in major cities? Because, I mean, that could be one explanation for why everybody is seeing all these people with walkie-talkies, all these sort of unusual-looking characters. If they're feds, um, that, that would make more sense. I'm not really sure how this worked during the Cold War era with with Sweden, but what was the presence of the the government like in in the streets? Was that common or no? Was that unheard of? I'm I'm curious about that. The driver noted that the two men who followed them onto the train also alighted behind them. It seems that whichever stop and whichever direction the palms took they would be under close surveillance. And also, as they bought their cinema tickets and watched the film. The film finished at 10 past 11, and the palms decided to walk home. Near the cinema, Saniva Thelistam noted a policeman. She thought it strange that he was not using his normal police handset, but a walkie-talkie. So she took note of the police car's registration, remembering only the last three numbers, 520. She heard the policeman say, OK, on this side. Then the patrol car sped off. Eleven seventeen. several streets further on towards the Palms' home. A witness, who we'll call Jerka, is walking along with his girlfriend. He spots a familiar face on the other side of the road, just by the gates of a cemetery. It is a local policeman, Thomas Lind. This is a reenactment. Lind is closely observing the street corner, walkie-talkie in hand. Mr. and Mrs. Palm pass by him at precisely 11.18. Then the couple cross the road because Mrs. Palm wants to look into a shop window. 200 meters away, another witness, Christian, is also on his way home. He notices two men, again with walkie-talkies, hanging around in front of an empty shop. This is unusual, and Christian is a little afraid because no one else is about. Later, he reports what he has seen to the police. He wasn't aware at the time that one of these men was a policeman himself. Soon afterwards, Christian starts to receive threatening phone calls. 11.20. The palms continue on their way along Svevagen Street. 
These are the last few meters that Olaf Palm will ever walk. At the corner of Tunnel Gatan, he passes Decorima, a store which sells paint. A man has been waiting there on the doorstep for the past three minutes. It is exactly 11.21. Pan passes him. His wife is a couple of steps ahead. The man steps out and fires two shots. Pan is hit from close range. Olof Pan dies instantly. My name is Gösta Söderström. I was a policeman, but I've taken retirement. I was still in service when Olaf Palm was assassinated. My patrol car was parked there, and uh, Olaf Palm was struck down here. There were 10 or 12 people around him, and a couple of them were trying to save him with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and cardiac massage. Among the bystanders, there is a man shouting, he ran off that way. The killer fled up 89 steps to reach Malmskidnadskatan. One of the witnesses sets off in pursuit, but he loses the trail of the man on David Begara's gutter. Incredibly, the street is totally deserted. Suddenly, he is blinded by the headlights of a police car, which slowly passes him by. He flags it down. Later, he reports that the registration number ends with the numbers 520. Three minutes after the shots were fired, press photographer Acker Malmström spends his nights monitoring the police communications wave band so he can race to the scene if anything newsworthy happens. On his radio scanner, he intercepts a conversation taking place on walkie-talkies. I was sitting in my car and had switched on my telephone and the radio as usual. I heard this conversation. Hello up there. How are you doing? It's cold, someone replied. And then the first voice continued. The prime minister has been killed. Then nothing. Not a sound. This is wild. Um, it's partially wild because it could be the cops doing surveillance. Like you would think that they would be doing, right? You would assume that a prime minister wouldn't just be gallivanting out and about with nobody official watching him. But not using official channels is weird them like I, I don't know the the guy being the the guy that ends up being the gunman only being there for a minute or two is weird I don't know like I said I don't I'm taking all this in from an outside perspective so I'm sort of trying to piece together an opinion on the fly <clears throat> but it's I mean it seems a bit odd the the walkie-talkies more than anything because I could totally rationalize police surveillance but but why on an unofficial channel radio communications play an important part in the events of that night so many men with walkie-talkies two of whom were in full sight of the crime scene from the moment that Olaf Pan left the cinema more than a dozen men were seen hanging around sending radio messages the trail of the assassin was lost not far from one group who were equipped with walkie-talkies. It is 11.25. 
500 meters from the place where Olaf Palm's body lies sprawled on the pavement, a number 43 bus approaches the stop at Eriksberg's Katten. Two men, agitated and out of breath, are waiting for it. Their behavior is strange. Later, the bus driver and two of the passengers identify them. They are Thomas Lind and Niels Horn. Thomas Lind was the police officer who'd been spotted seven minutes earlier by the cemetery. Niels Holm was also a policeman. The two had been part of a special squad which handled petty crime. The squad was nicknamed the Baseball League, and the majority of its members were linked to the extreme right. Lind and Holm had been accused of police brutality time and again, but none of the incidents... That seems odd to me that a specific group that's about petty crime would have a bunch of its its people linked to to a certain political affiliation just because that seems like sort of a random a random grouping to all or not all but for a lot of them to have the same sort of anything but especially especially like a political affiliation were followed up in spite of enormous public outrage against the activities of the Baseball League. The journalist, Ola Minel, had investigated this special police squad and had followed the careers of its members. In 1983, the squad had to be broken up because it had become uncontrollable. Since then, the police force of normal was reformed into two groups, League A and League B, and the members of the baseball league were incorporated into both. Normal police is an important division in Stockholm. It's based in the normal district close to the seat of government. Several officers who have sympathies with the extreme right are part of this division. In general, the Swedish police have leanings towards the Social Democrats, of whom Olof Palm was the leader. At the beginning of the 80s, the extremists of the right in the police force tended to be the youngest and the most brutal. That's how their colleagues perceived them. They were a law unto themselves and organized special evenings which they called friendship nights. And what did they used to do? There, they'd listen to invited fascist guest speakers who spouted extreme right policies. Then they'd all dance to German military music. Whoa! The, the term extreme right is thrown around a lot today. So, so it's both political extremes are thrown around a lot. Um, so it's kind of hard to like get a grasp of what people are actually talking about when they reference like the extremes of one side or the other. But Jesus, calling in fascist speakers and and dancing to German military music. That's a, that's, that's going pretty far. They even adopted the Hitler salute. God. Only hours after the assassination, League A of the normal police held such an evening. According to several witnesses, the officer who presided even proposed a toast to the murder of Palm, and nobody raised objections. Okay, so it's not... It's not that a, a whole group had ties to to one political affiliation. It's just that there is a group within them that has ties to this affiliation. That affiliation is wildly, wildly fascist, neo-fascist leaning. And they don't really have any issue with this. They're certainly not on board with like the social democrats that he that Olaf Palma represents. So that's obviously you, anytime you have any people or group like that, that has any power whatsoever, you kind of look at them side-eyed anyway. But in a situation like this, I could definitely see why people were, you know, 
looking at them a, a little suspiciously. Obliged to explain, this chief said that in his way, he had been paying tribute to the good work of his men on the night of the murder. Because this was an evening held in private, no inquiry was ever carried out on this chief or his associates. Wait, what? Is that a thing? Are you not, is it, is it like not a part of the investigation because it happened privately? What's the, what, I don't really understand the explanation for that. That because it was a private event, it, it wasn't looked into deeper. I don't know. Somebody, somebody explain that to me because it, it either doesn't make sense or it went over my head. The day of the killing, Hans Homer, Stockholm's overall police chief, took charge of the murder inquiry. This was the same man who had created the baseball league and who'd been proud of the squad's work. Holmer had equipped them with automatic weapons, which are banned in Sweden. They must have been acquired illegally. He even fitted his office with bulletproof windows without the permission of his superiors. Holmer obtained the windows, the weapons, and a large stock of walkie-talkies from a certain P.J. Karlström, a former police officer, a man of the extreme right who'd become an arms dealer. There are many photographs in existence which show him executing the Hitler salute, some taken in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. In his arsenal, the same type of bullets which killed Palm could be found. Karlström had been in hospital after an appendicitis operation, but signed himself out on the day of the murder against the advice of his doctor. That night, he's known to have made contact at least twice with one of the mysterious characters who carried walkie-talkies. An internal police dossier profiles Karlström as cold, insensitive, and perfectly capable of murder. One of his company officers is situated in this building on the route the killer took to flee the scene. It was around here that the witness who'd given chase lost the trail. The prosecutor in charge of the affair would exclaim in 1994 that Karlström had no alibi for the time of the crime, but no inquiry was made against Karlström because he was supposed to be in hospital on that day. The house just opposite. Two of the men with walkie-talkies had taken up position just in front. A colleague of Karlström lives there. Both he and Karlström are members of the same gun club. Bjorn Skogsfeld, the club's shooting instructor, is also an extremist who especially idolized the Chilean junta. The night of the murder, he was in police car number 3230. It wasn't a regular squad car but he'd used it to go and move his own private car because it was parked illegally. He'd only been able to find a second parking spot, which was also illegal. That's how he'd found himself close to the murder scene. During the time he moved his own car, he'd left police car 3230 at the head of the stairway that the killer took during his escape. It precisely overlooks the scene of the shooting. And it's exactly where Skogsfeld's personal car was parked that the witness in pursuit saw the fleeing killer for the last time. At the moment the shots were fired, Skogsfeld got into the police car and drove off. Man, this whole thing has been... <clears throat> this whole thing has been wild. Um, how... Is this still a thing? And I'm talking about specifically in Sweden... Are these types of political dynamics still still at play, still going back and forth? Um, like I said, there's a the the term extreme left and right gets thrown around quite a bit. But this seems like for real I mean, geez, that dude was that picture was was wild. To, to look at of that guy. So what what's it like now? Is this done? Is it still a thing? 
how how exactly what's modern day Swedish politics like in the in, answers in the most uh oh I don't know in the most like non toxic way possible. The circumstances surrounding the bullets which killed Olaf Palm are equally strange. One of them wasn't found until 37 hours after the murder, yet it was only four meters away from where Palm had fallen. The second bullet was found immediately and was taken as evidence by one of the investigating policemen. What? Both bullets had been cleaned before being finally presented to the laboratory. This is the information sheet put out by the head of the police inquiry. It reads 2323, the first alert. Ten seconds later, the first squad car arrives on the scene. This is in total contradiction with the witness statement given by Leif Lundqvist. He tried to call the emergency number from his car immediately after hearing the shots. Lundqvist was put on hold for 80 seconds. When an officer finally responded, the line was cut, apparently by a third person. The office of the head of police communications is in the same building as that of the arms dealer, Kolström. There are photographs of this police communications chief also making the Hitler salute, and he's also a member of the same shooting club. Hans Zetterland was on duty at the police radio communication center. This is unusual. Normally, he's on patrol in vehicle 3230, the same car that was parked on the killer's getaway route just before the murder. He too is a member of the gun club. Emergency calls take priority over all others, but Zetterland doesn't take this into account. He replies to a call from a taxi rank rather than calls from the murder scene. When the taxi driver reports gunshots, Zetterland hangs up. It seems that Hans Zetterland went even further in delaying response to the assassination. Brothers Kari and Perti Puitinen Two information technology specialists have made inquiries into the dysfunction at the police radio center and interviewed Hans Zetterlund. He didn't even call an ambulance, although he knew that a man had been shot down. He didn't report the incident as the rules require. Equally, he didn't inform the superior officer in charge that evening. The emergency services were astounded that the police hadn't called an ambulance to the scene. Their call was recorded. You're not aware of what happened? Reply, no, we haven't received any calls. That call was made two minutes after the police are known to have arrived on the scene. The lack of police response was astounding. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop it right here for the first half. I'm probably just going to watch the second half and, and record right after it, but I want to cut it into two parts so that it's not an hour and a half long video. Okay, somebody poke holes in this, or this seems like incredibly bizarre. Is, is all of this true? And what are the tie-ins? Like, what are things... What are things that were found or seen that would point in another direction or to another group or, or anything like that? I'm just, I'm curious about everything about this because this so far looks and sounds wild, wild. Um, but all right, I'll get the next part out as quickly as I can. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. If you want to join the Discord, and continue these conversations over there. I'll put the link in the description box down below, and I will see you all in the second half.